things that might be a little bit different for you if you've been here before. One, today's a family Sunday, so we have some of our kindergarten through fifth grade friends in the room. Anybody else in here? It's okay to talk in church right now. Yeah, they're in the room, okay. So hopefully they got a note-taking page when they came in. There's several blanks I'm going to have you fill in. One of them is, who is teaching today? My name's Doug. You can write my name in there. I'll give you some blanks. There's also a word search. Let's see if you can beat my time of two and a half minutes of finding those words. Um, and I also found a few words that weren't on the list. So see if you can do that. Also up here that might be different, if you weren't here last week, is this monitor. For the, those of us that are excited that football's back, we're going to start streaming college football highlights to keep you engaged in the message. <laughs> Put it here. No, that's not why it's here. We're doing Facebook Live. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, thanks for joining us. It's a way to make it shareable, or if someone's traveling and can't be here, or even just expand the reach a little bit. So we're going to do that, so that this way can all be in one shot with the camera, uh, but the uh, side screens will still have the points up there as well. We're in this series called Go Time, because God is a God of Go. He does it a lot, and he asks us to do it a lot. And I think he asks us to do it a lot to go, because I think a lot of times we get stuck. Not like it's stuck in like, quicksand. And by the way, as a kid, I really thought there'd be more quicksand in the world than I've experienced. That felt like a very real threat as a kid. I used to watch a show called Gilligan's Island. There was always quicksand. And I don't think I've ever seen quicksand. Kind of disappointed, not going to lie. But not like stuck in something or stuck in a trap, but in our life as we're growing, as we're moving and growing our faith, we get stuck. So God tells us to go, to do something. And so we've talked about a lot of different things, to, to go and make a difference, to go and make disciples, to go make it right where we not, may not be together, to go together because together is better than alone. And as we talk about these ways that God asks us to go, here's why it matters that you listen when God tells you to go do something. One, you're going to know God better. You're going to trust him more and develop a deeper faith. And you're going to also discover what God's purposes are for your life when he asks you to go. Well, the very first week, we talked about this one specific go, and it was go first. And that's what leaders do. That's what leadership is. You go first. And what we said that week, and I'll say it again because this is so important. And this is why when God tells some of you to go do something, it's so important you do it, not for you, but because of this reason. Sometimes the only thing that's needed is for somebody to go first. Sometimes people kind of hang back from doing the right thing until someone steps forward and does the right thing and then others follow. Unfortunately, it works the other way too. Sometimes someone goes first and does the wrong thing and people follow. Be the person that goes first and does the right thing. And the way I want to ask you to go first today, I want to ask you to go first by going last. Go first by going last. There's this idea that Jesus talked about a lot, that the way to go first is to put others first. In Mark 9, 35, it says this. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12, that's his disciples, and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And if you're filling in blanks on the kid's note-taking page, whether you're a kid or an adult, you're using it. Sometimes all it takes is for someone to go first. That was the first one. And here's the verse, Mark 9, 35. Anyone who wants to be first must be very last and the servant of all. And here's what Jesus was saying. He's telling us it's very important that we go, for, go last and put others first by being a servant of Servant of all. That's not what I want to do. I don't want to listen to that go that God asked me to do. To go put others first. Now, full disclosure, I'm an only child. I didn't grow up with brothers or sisters, and that explains a lot about me. But there's a lot of selfishness in me. In any situation, I'm thinking about me. How does it impact me? What, what's here for me? Like, I have a very me focus. I think I... That's not just an only child thing. I think a lot of times we do that. We think that I've got to put myself first 
to get the most out of life. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. For a number of reason, uh, reasons, you're going to experience the best stuff in life if you'll put others first. That doesn't make sense in my mind. But if you think about it, I want you to think some of the best and some of the worst leaders you've ever met in life. And don't say their name, but if you were to think of who is a really good leader or who is a really bad leader, chances are the really good leaders were servant leaders. They served others. They used their leadership and power to make life go better for others. And probably the bad leaders you think of are the leaders that put themselves first and they use their power and influence to make stuff go well for themselves. And what Jesus said, the idea of being a servant of all, has a lot to do with our identity. And if you could buy into this, I think it would change your life and it could change our world. There's a difference between serving and being a servant. Jesus asked us to be a servant. But serving is a good thing. Serving others is a great thing. But the thing is, if I just say this week, I'm going to go serve others, that's actually not what Jesus said here. He said to be a servant of all. Being a servant is an identity. It's who I am. Serving is what I do. And if it's just what I do, then I'm in control of it. I decide where, when, who, and how. I'll serve that person on that day in this way at that time. I'm in control. But if you're a servant, you serve whoever, wherever, whenever, and however. There's a huge difference. And serving others is a good thing. Be, go first and serve others. That's a good thing. The great thing, the best thing, the life-changing thing for you is to say, no, 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 my identity is to be a servant. So it doesn't matter who, where, how, or when, I will serve others always. That's where it's hard to get buy-in. Because I want to control, I want to serve the, the certain people at certain times in certain ways on my timetable. But Jesus says, no, you're going to miss it. Be a servant. And if you've ever met somebody like that, they stand out in a good way. I met somebody like that. I'm a hockey fan. I talk about that a lot. Most of you, if not all of you, are not, and that's okay. But let me just tell you about somebody I met, that they're such an amazing person that they actually have a bobblehead. You know what a bobblehead is, right? Like one of these? Like if you have a bobblehead, that means you're somebody, right? Well, this guy's name is Roger Nielsen. And he passed away in 2003, and that's Roger. He is in the Hockey Hall of Fame because he was an amazing coach. He was very innovative. He knew the rule book so well that there were at least three occasions they had to rewrite the rules because he found loopholes. I'll give you one example. In hockey, kind of like in soccer, if you're trailing, I think soccer, if you're trailing at the end of the game, you can pull your goalie for an extra attacker. Is that a soccer thing? Close enough. Okay, thank you. So in hockey, it's a thing. So what he did is he read the rules so well. As a matter of fact, like in his leisure time, people said, we would see him just reading the rule book. And like, you know it already. He goes, no, 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 there's more in here. And one day he thought about this. So when I pull my goalie, can I? What if he can just leave his stick laying there? So he tells his goalie, hey, in about one minute, Roger says, I'm going to pull the goalie. When you come out, just lay your stick across the goal crease. Sure enough, they, they did it. The puck came down, hit the stick, bounced out. And the referees are going, I think you can't do that. And Roger said, here's the rules. Here's the rules. Next year, the rule book was rewritten. Three times they rewrote the rule book because he found these loopholes. He was, his nickname was Captain Video. Back in the 60s, he was one of the first people to really bring in looking at video and breaking down game film. It was on a reel-to-reel -reel projector. He was one of the first people to have his assistant coaches on the bench and in the press box wired into a headset. One of the first people to think of that. He was just this innovative, creative guy. And he spent hours not just being a great hockey coach. What was great about him is he... he he got the best out of anybody who played for him. They had career years under him. Underperforming teams overperformed. Average players became great players under him. He was very successful. But one of the things about Roger was great. And I actually got a chance to meet him. Have you ever, like, who is it in your life 
that if you met a certain celebrity for you, you would become speechless. Like, who would that be for you? Maybe Jarrett Culver. Jarrett Culver was at the Tech game yesterday. Shout out a name if you met somebody, they would be that for you. Will Smith. Who? Tom Selleck. I'll allow it. Somebody else. Bob Wills? Bob Lilly. I heard a mm hmm when someone said Bob Wills. That's okay. Uh, anybody else? Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill. So we have actors and musicians and actors and football players. Mine is a hockey player, a hockey coach. Never, never actually played, but he coached hockey. And I first met Roger, I was just starstruck. And what struck me first, though, uh, quickly, was not, I have trouble talking this, but how much he genuinely took interest in me. And this, one of his uh, players and co assistant coaches that co coached with him had this quote to say about him. Think about if this could be said about you. He said this, Roger genuinely likes people, genuinely cares about his players, not just their performance, but their lives. And then listen to this, you sense quickly, it's not just what you can do for him, but what he can do for you. What do people sense when they come across you? Do they sense it's what can you do for me? Or do they sense what can I do for you? I experienced that from him. Roger uh, never married, uh, and so he devoted a lot of hours to hockey, but he also gave a lot of time to the community of serving people and looking after people and kind of making a family just out of players and friends and people that needed connection. He took a large group of people every year to Hawaii, to Maui. One year, Jennifer and I were going to Maui for the first time. And somehow, I met Roger four times, tops. Spoke with him half a dozen times, tops. Roger finds out through a friend that I'm going to Hawaii and calls me. He says, I heard you're going to Maui. When you get there, I want you to go to this place and eat breakfast. Tell them you know me. If you want to go snorkeling or scuba diving, go to this place. Tell them you know me. If you go to this hotel, don't tell them you know me. <laughs> like, he was really funny. He had a great sense of humor. But I, why would he do that? Because he genuinely cares about people. And you sense, what can I do for you? That's what I sensed from Roger. Twice, he agreed to be a chapel speaker for me um, via uh, speakerphone. It was the days before FaceTime. And he said, hey, if you ever need a chapel speaker, I'd be glad to talk about my faith to your hockey players uh, on speakerphone. And he did it twice. Just an amazing man. What separates him from everybody else, hockey aside, was how much he valued people and he was a servant of all. And they said, you could have been a player, a coach, the guy who drove the Zamboni, that's the thing that resurfaces the ice, the custodian, a fan, just a random person on the street. You got the same experience from him because he was a servant of all. What do people sense from you? Are you a servant of all, someone who serves others and thinks quickly, how can I, what can I do for you? Jesus later said this in Mark chapter 10. Jesus calls together his disciples and he says, you know how those who were regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and how their high officials exercise authority over them. That's what typically leaders do. They have power they serve themselves, or they go hammer people down. They drop the hammer on people. Instead, he says, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, it's go time. It's going to be different with you. What you're going to do is you're going to go do something different. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Not just go serve others. Be a servant. It's your identity. Whoever, wherever, whenever, however. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave or servant of all. And then Jesus says, if you want to know what this looks like, there's an even better example than Roger Nielsen. He says, what have you seen in my life? Verse, verse 45, for even the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And when you look at the life of Jesus, he was a servant of all. And if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, that's what he's going to make you into be. A disciple of Jesus learns about Jesus and what he taught and how he lives, but then you become like him. 
And he'll ask you to be a servant of all too. The Apostle Paul tells us this way in Philippians 2. He said this, do nothing. Okay, that rules out everything. Like, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit in terms of how you think of yourself higher than others. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. The only child of me says, but what about me? Like, okay, if I'm always looking after other inter uh, others' interests, what about me? This is why we live in community. Because that way, if I'm looking after the needs of others, the others are, I'm on their radar. They're looking after my needs too. And rather than just having me looking after my interests, I've got community, I've got others I'm doing life with that are looking after my interests as well. If we buy into this, think how different our world would be if we chose to be a servant of all. And then Paul says, hey, again, here's the example. Verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset. That word means attitude or way of thinking as Christ Jesus. How would Jesus think about others if he were in your family, in your classroom, on your team, at your workplace, in your neighborhood? How would he think of others? He'd be a servant of all. And Paul says, if, if you want me to kind of spell, flesh out what it looks like for Jesus, verse 6 and following, it says this. Who, being in very nature God, like Jesus is God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a, what's the word? Servant. That was his identity. He said, I'm the, I'm, I'm the, I'm the son of God. Everything should revolve around me, but instead, I'm going to step out of that position to be a servant and serve others. Being made in human likeness, basically showing up in the flesh, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And again, think of what Jesus said. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. No one has served you better than Jesus and him giving his life for you at the cross that's the ultimate act of service and then jesus when that he does that and becomes obedient in in every single way even death to a cross being a servant of all this is what it says about why jesus should be worshiped therefore god exalted him to the highest place gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth in every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everything Jesus did was to call attention to his heavenly Father. But it also sets an example for us that God celebrates people who are a servant. And he asks us to do that, to make that our identity. Again, Mark 9.35, Jesus said this, sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be first, must be the very last and the servant of all. So we live in a day and age where they can actually map your mind. They can see things about our brain that we've never been able to see before in history. And what science tells us about, neuroscience tells us about our brain is there's a part of your brain that lights up, it starts firing when you experience something good. Um... For instance, what's something that would make you smile or kind of enjoy life? Like, what is that for you? Coffee. A tech victory. Grandchildren. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Says the man who works for Chick-fil-A. Purple gape, grape Gatorade. Very good. Did anybody say Chocolate. Some people, it's chocolate, right? Who said chocolate? Right over there? Okay, this is yours. This is a chocolate bar just for you. It's part of my kid's band fundraiser, so I'm basically paid a dollar, but using the message. So, right? Can you catch? We'll see. <laughs> I think they're applauding the throw more than the catch. I'm sorry about that, but that was right on the money. I led you just kind of out there. The kids couldn't get up and get it. Like, I led it just above their heads. It was a perfect throw. So here's the deal. If, if she likes chocolate, if you like football, if your grandkids come over, if that's your thing that lights it up, 
the same way it lights up when you have that chocolate, strength the grandkids, see a tech victory, is the same thing that lights up when you serve others and do something kind. So here's what they've discovered about your brain. The, the, hey, I really like that part of your brain that lights up, doesn't just light up when someone does something kind to you. It lights up in the same way when you do something kind for others. They call it the helper's high. Like you do something kind to others and you just feel better. Anyone, has anyone ever experienced that? Raise your hand. A lot of you. God created you to be kind to others. He wired your brain. When he's putting together your brain, he wired it to say, I want them to get a hit like they just had a bite of chocolate when they do something kind for others. Why is that? Because you were created to be a servant. A servant is not a, it's beneath me kind of role. It's above you. It's the highest calling to be a servant of all. And again, how would our world be different if more people had that mindset? I have power. How can I serve others? I have money. I have resources. How can I use that to be kind to others? And God said, it's not going to be just completely like a bummer, like your brain's going to light up to say, I like that. Dopamine's like released in your system. Like you just had some chocolate. You were created to be kind, to go first. You were made to not just serve, to be a servant. So on the kids' note-taking page on the back, it's got two questions to ask. I want you all to think about this. Uh, there's actually three questions, but two are up here. First one is this. Who will I serve this week? And how will I serve them? See, it's very tempting to hear a message like this and nod and go, yeah, that's good, I agree, we should be a servant of all. And then you leave here and then you don't do anything different. So I want to give you kind of two ways to think about this. Who will you serve and how specifically will you serve them before you leave the property today? Like before you get out of the park, parking lot, maybe you open the door for someone in your family or you open the door as you leave. I think we have greeters that do that, but, but like maybe, maybe there's something you could do to just show a little interest in somebody and be kind. How will you do that before the day is over? Who will that be? How specifically will you do that? And then who will you do that for this week? And how will you do that? And I don't want you to think about the easy, low-hanging fruit, like, well, I'll do it for this person, like, because I'll do it for my teacher because we got a test coming up, and, you know, I need all the help I can get. Like, don't do that. Do it for someone that you might not normally do that for. Push yourself. Step out of your comfort zone. But before you leave the room, I want you to be able to answer the question, who will you serve? How specifically will you serve them? You know what we said last week? We talked about what Jesus said. He said, if someone asks you to go one mile, go two. Because at that time, if you lived in, in, the, in the, uh, Jerusalem in that area, they were, under, they were occupied by the Roman army. They had a different uh, government ruling their country. And the rule said that if a Roman soldier came up and said, hey, I'll carry my stuff, you had to carry it for one mile, but you didn't have to go any further. One mile was far enough, but you had to do one. And Jesus said, no, go two. Go the extra mile. So if you're thinking about who you're going to serve and how you're going to do that, go further than you think you need to. Serve them above and beyond what would be you think would be expected or normal. Okay, does everybody have to, somebody in mind of who they're going to serve this week and how they're going to serve them? Does anybody have anything in mind for who they're going to serve and how they're going to serve them? Raise your hand if anybody has that in mind. Okay, I'm going to start calling on people. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Somebody just really freaked out. Okay, here's the deal. That's an important question. It helps you put it into practice. But remember, Jesus' big challenge to us wasn't the answer to who and how. It's to be a servant of all. So what I really want to challenge you to do is on a regular basis this week, Say to yourself, I'm a servant of all. As, as you, you're going into the classroom, say, I'm here to learn and to be a good classmate, but I'm here to be a servant of all. If you're going in to teach that class, I'm here to be a servant of all. If you're going into your, into your house today, I'm here to be a servant of all. As you go to work and you walk in, I'm here to be a servant of all. And that has less to do with customer service and more about being who God created you to be. 
Because Jesus, when he showed up, he said, I'm here to be a servant of all, and I want my disciples to follow my example. Now, here's the thing. This week, I want to challenge you to do this. Every time somebody crosses your path, every time you lock eyes with somebody, I want you to remind yourself that they matter to God. They matter to him greatly. And rather than asking yourself, what can they do for me? I want you to silently ask yourself, what can I do for you? Anytime you see somebody, you don't have to say it out loud, but sometimes it's okay to ask. But silently, every time you see somebody, what can I do for them? What can I do for you? And keep telling yourself the words that Jesus said that he wants to be true of you. You are a servant of all. That's your identity. It's not on your to-do list. It's on your to-be list. Hello, my name is a servant of all. That's what your name tag should read this week because that's who God created you to be. Let's stand for closing prayer. Hey, God, thanks so much for serving us at the cross, the greatest expression of service and love we could ever see. I pray that it would change the way we think of ourselves, the way we would think of others, and the way we serve others throughout the week. And God, I do pray we get specific and think who and how can we serve, but you called us to do more than that. You called us to be a servant, that to be our identity, that we serve whoever, wherever, whenever, and however. God, thank you that that's your approach toward us. And I pray it would change the way that we love and serve others. Help us to go. It's go time to go put others first and put ourselves last. But thank you that you said that's actually how we win this game in life, that we serve others because that's when we know we're most like you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here. You're out a few minutes early, so give me grace next time I go late.